Well, welcome everybody to this uh, lecture today. I think will be a very interesting one. You know, everything has a beginning and an end. The beginning is most, in most all cases, determines the end, as well as the course of events leading to the end. Thus, the present Third Republic of Armenia can trace its beginnings to the National Democratic Movement, better known as the Karabakh. Not only was it the spark that ignited the movement that led to Armenia's independence, but it was also the spark that set the forces in motion that brought about the breakup of the Soviet Union. History should record that Karabakh came before Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and the Baltic region. Came before those republics so far as breaking away from the Soviet Union and really triggering the events that happened afterwards. The end, the reconstituting of the independent Republic of Armenia is a reality. What its future will be is tied to its beginnings, as well as the international geopolitical forces. Tonight we will relive some of the euphoria and excitement that characterize the beginning, and we will also gain a better and deeper understanding of the I mean, its present situation. Mark Malkasian has captured that moment, a turning point in history, in his early, newly published book, Karabakh, and gives us an insight as only a journalist can. Mark is a native of Fresno, California. I don't know whether he's permanently transplanted here or not, but at least he's with us for a while. And he's the author of the book, Karabakh, The Emergence of the National Movement in Armenia. <clears throat> he was a graduate student in Yerevan State University at the time the Karabakh Movement began in 1988. He's worked as a high school teacher, as a journalist, and as a researcher at the Zoyan Institute since 1990, he has been the curriculum developer of the Choices for the 21st Century, Century Education Project at Brown University. Mark has received his master's degree in history from UCLA in 1982. So it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce Mark Markation. Thank you, Mr. Yang, for that introduction. Uh, I'm afraid you you stole a good chunk of my introduction, though. Uh, essentially, um, as Manu pointed out, uh, tonight's lecture is about a happier time, if you will, in Armenia, a more optimistic time. We're going to return to the year 1988 uh, to look at the origins of the, uh, the so-called Karabakh movement in Armenia. And... As, as Mr. Young also pointed out, the era that Armenia is passing through today, in many senses, can be termed the post karabakh movement era. The whole former Soviet Union, of course, is passing through the, the post-Soviet era. In the case of Armenia, though, it's, it's, it's colored really by the, the Karabakh movement of 1988. I guess to, to demonstrate... Uh, what that means, the last presidential election, September of, of last year, the two leading candidates, of course, Levandir Petrosyan, Vaskan Manugyan, were, vo were both leading members of the Karabakh Committee uh, beginning in 1988. And in fact, a campaign issue arose as to who played a more prominent role in the committee. And it was, it was legitimately debated in the, uh, in the press. Who was more important? What did they do? What did they contribute? Both, both of these candidates draw legitimacy from participating in the Karabakh Committee, participating in the Karabakh Movement. And in a sense, um, Levon Depertosian today is judged by the promises, the commitments he made during that earlier, more optimistic time. Uh, today... Um, I'd like to start a bit about 
recalling um, that period from a more personal perspective, going back again to um, 1988. And in fact, I was a, a graduate student at Yerevan State University in the year, in the academic year, 1987, 1988. <clears throat> As you might know, during the Soviet period, from uh, the mid 60s, almost to the close, the Soviets had a, had a program for Armenia, a special program for Armenia, whereby uh, students from the diaspora could go to Armenia for a year, uh, in some cases for, for four years, um, and study for free, essentially. Armenians from the Middle East, Lebanon, Syria primarily, would go there and earn their degrees. Uh, they would they would be legitimate students. In the case of students from the United States, uh, a handful from France, Latin America, etc., uh, they would go there, as I said, for maybe a year, learn the language, be exposed to the culture, uh, kind of take a vacation from from life. And that's what I was doing. <laughs> that's what I was doing essentially in 1987, 1988. When I arrived in Armenia, though, Armenia was still uh, a country very much stuck in the Soviet system. If you recall, 1987 was a year in which the momentum of Glasnost and Perestroika was just beginning to build. Uh, Gorbachev had come to power in 1985. Uh, by 86, he announced his policy of Glasnost, 87. The first um, attempts to implement perestroika restructuring are underway, and throughout the the Soviet Union, there's this, there's there's a sense of optimism, the sense that things are 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 perhaps moving forward toward democracy, kind of uh, recalling the the early days of of the Khrushchev era. Armenia, though, in the fall of '87 when I arrived there, was an exception to that trend. Um, Armenia was a backwater. Uh, Yerevan was, was considered very much a provincial city. Uh, Armenians themselves, they had a, essentially an inferiority complex. Nothing much happened in Armenia, supposedly. Uh, as far as where Armenia fit in, in the rest of the Soviet Union, well, I mean, Armenians were, were Caucasians, like Azerbaijanis or Georgians or Chechens. Uh, certainly in educational terms, Armenians were, were very advanced, but as far as the, the attitudes of Russians or Ukrainians, well, Armenians were those guys that, that brought the fruit to the, the, the markets in Moscow and, and Leningrad during the summer, or the funny comics in, in old Soviet films, things like that. But again, it, it wasn't a place in the fall of 1987 that in any way was on the lean edge that was a trendsetter. And uh, when I arrived, I had a, a chance to um, become acquainted with um, a group of teachers at an experimental school in Armenia. I'm a, a high school teacher by background. So this was a, an interesting, interesting place for me, a, a chance for, for me to, to get a first-hand look at what was going on educationally in Armenia. As it turned out, um, this school that I was, I was a regular visitor to turned out to be a center of the Karabakh movement. And before, five or six months before the Karabakh movement even started, um, I had become good friends with a number of the teachers and uh, administrators at the school that were to emerge as the leaders of the Karabakh movement. Uh, the movement itself, of course, uh, erupted in, um, 19, in February of 1988, uh, when it did explode, so to speak, when we had a million people in the streets in, in Yerevan, all of a sudden Armenia seemed as, as if it were the center of the world. As uh, Manu pointed out, um, the, um, the demonstrations that erupted in Yerevan, at that time, were by far, by far the largest demonstrations 
that had, e that had ever been seen in the Soviet Union. Uh, even in the, in the Glasnost era, the only public protest before this had been uh, a few thousand students in Kazakhstan, a few Crimean Tatars in, in Moscow. Uh, there had been um, really not even full-fledged demonstrations, but attempts at demonstrations in Lithuania. But to have a million people on the streets in uh, February of 1988 gave Armenians the sense that, that all of a sudden the world was looking at them. And, and, and to a large extent, uh, uh, the world was looking at Armenia in February of 1988. I remember from, from that period uh, getting together, especially with a few of the other uh, uh, diaspora and Armenians, from the West, from, from Europe, from the United States, from Latin America, in debating how the Karabakh movement was being portrayed in the Western media. Um, some of us were sure that the, the full story was getting out, that, uh, that uh, the Karabakh movement itself was being depicted for what it was, that is a, a, a civil rights struggle, um, a legitimate struggle for, for self-determination. Others had their doubts. Uh, some of us thought that, um, that essentially the news coming out of Armenia was being filtered through Moscow, uh, that Armenians were, were being depicted in negative fas fashion. We didn't, we didn't have any way of, of confirming um, our suspicions or our hopes in either case. Um, news was not reaching Armenia. There had been a, a ban imposed on uh, Western journalists uh, after the first, I think, two or three days of the Karabakh movement. So no one, no one from the West was actually reaching Armenia to report what was happening. So these, this was speculation essentially on our part as to how the the movement itself was being portrayed. Uh, when I when I finally came back to the United States in the summer of 1988, my fears were confirmed. That is, after reading uh, a few articles from the mainstream press, I realized that, in fact, the Karabakh movement from the outset had been portrayed essentially as an ethnic feud, two squabbling peoples, uh, a battle over, over territory, um, a very narrow-minded nationalistic struggle. So in the end, it was the, the Moscow interpretation, if you will, that won out in terms of, of how the Western media saw the, the Karabakh movement. Uh, at the time, I, I conducted a number of interviews with uh, some of the leaders of the movement. So when I came back, uh, I published a few articles in the Armenian press, hoping to, to more or less... Um, set the story straight, at least, at least for the American Armenian audience, if nothing else. Um, I didn't have a, a great deal of hope as far as the larger media was concerned, because by that time, the story had already been pitched. It had been angled. This ethnic feud idea had already been established. And once an idea is established in the media, uh, it's very hard to break that mold. Uh, after uh, Levon Der Petrosian was elected to the presidency, this is in, in the summer of 1990, not the, the formal election in 1991, but in, in the summer of 1990 when, when he was elected to uh, the presidency by the Armenian Supreme Soviet, uh, uh, myself and, and two of my friends teamed up to, uh, to write essentially what was going to be a, a positive public relations Piece on the Der Petrosian government. And if, if we can somehow bring ourselves back to the summer of 1990, I think uh, we'll recall that we were all rather optimistic and hopeful about what the Der Petrosian government was going to bring to Armenia. This was supposed to be a, obviously a democratic government. This was supposed to be uh, a government that was going to emphasize transparency and op openness. It's going to be a government that was going to um, restore Armenia's position in the world. So I think all of us were, were hopeful. And, and around that time, 
a book was published um, on the uh, Thayutis movement in Lithuania by a uh, professor at uh, the University of California at Berkeley. And that was kind of our model. Like I said, we were going to kind of uh, build up Der Petrosian's image and, and show the the the, uh, the world that the Armenian National Movement, the Haha Show, was was a democratic, uh, legitimate government. Anyway, the um, the the book that I started researching uh, late in 1990 turned into um, a three and a half four year project for me. And during the course of that three and a half, four years, my two collaborators, collaborators turned against the government. In fact, they became very sharp critics of the government. They'll go unnamed uh, as far as lecture is concerned tonight. But suffice it to say that uh, the last thing they would do at this point would be to write anything favorable about uh, the Dare Petrosian government. Um, and of course, my attitudes changed as well. Um, I think all of us in the diaspora, obviously anyone in Armenia, was disillusioned by uh, 1994, if not 1995, certainly. Uh, in that case, my purpose shifted from public relations to putting something on the historical record. And I say that uh, because I believe that there are at least two important reasons why the facts of the Karabakh movement, and I'm, I'm specific, specifically referring to the year 1988, the origin of the movement. I think there are two specific reasons why uh, that those facts have to be put on the historical record now. Um, first of all, the movement itself in Armenia has become a political football. Uh, as I mentioned, it was um, a campaign issue in the 1996 presidential elections. Um, most of the, the leaders of the Karabakh movement either are currently playing very prominent roles in the government or have been involved in politics in the recent past. Unfortunately, uh, that involvement in politics has meant that they're willing to, to stretch the truth a bit about their own roles in the Karabakh movement, and also, of course, to, to put down their, their former colleagues in the movement. So the, the sources themselves are no longer reliable. You can't go back today to Armenia, for example, and try to reconstruct what happened in 1988 by talking to the leading participants in the Karabakh movement. You're, you're not going to get a straight story on this. The second reason I think it's important to, uh, to get the facts out now is because within Armenia itself, these terrible conditions, these terrible winters that have taken such a toll on the people have really blurred the memories of the population. Um, going back again to 1988, 89 even, people were very optimistic. And I think that optimistic optimism carried through uh, all the way to Armenia's formal independence at the end of 1991. I think people had a better idea by then of the difficult road ahead, but uh, nonetheless, they had faith in their government. Um, they were fairly hopeful about the future. That's gone. That hope, that optimism, certainly the trust in the government, that's gone. And I think because the people in Armenia have suffered so, they themselves, in many respects, have forgotten what came before. They've forgotten, for example, the enthusiasm, the optimism they once had. So again, to go back today to Armenia and try to reconstruct what happened uh, nine years ago is, is no longer possible. Finally, in that sense, um, the, the final transformation, as far as my book was concerned, dealt with uh, its intended audience. As I mentioned, my first intent had been to... Um,
to write a public relations piece, a puff piece, if you will. By the time I got around to actually putting this book into shape, I, I came to appreciate that the real audience for the book wasn't in the diaspora, but in Armenia. Basically, for the reasons I outlined earlier, that is, the people in Armenia themselves have forgotten uh, the Karabakh movement. They've certainly forgotten the spirit of the Karabakh movement. And if I have any hope for this book, it's that one day, I don't expect it to be soon, I think the, the emotions are, are still a little bit too raw, but one day um, people in Armenia will be able to go back and more dispassionately, re dispassionately review that period in their history and extract, uh, so to speak, what's worth remembering. That is what they accomplished, what they achieved. I'd like to, to talk uh, a bit about that today. I'd like to talk uh, about how the, the movement started and, uh, and what that meant for Armenia. And again, let's, let's go back to uh, February of 1988. Here's Yerevan. Uh, not much is happening, as I said, in the way of, of Glasnost, per, Perestroika. Uh, not a lot of hope among the people that something is going to happen. The, uh, the leader at the time in Armenia is uh, Garen Demirjan. Uh, he's somebody that, that came to power in Armenia in 1974. By 1988, he's seen as, as very corrupt. In fact, uh, Gorbachev is, is publicly attacking him. Uh, he's being bombarded by the, the mainstream Soviet press as an opponent to, to Perestroika. Uh, not, a, not an impressive figure, and certainly not uh, a figure that, that Armenians themselves are proud of in any way. Uh, on the other hand, outside of Armenia, in, uh, in Mount Karabakh, this, this, this oblast within Azerbaijan, uh, there's a different feeling. The Karabakh Armenians have always been very different in temperament from their counterparts in Armenia proper. This goes back uh, not just uh, through Soviet times, but, but hundreds of years. Uh, better organized, uh, certainly more militant, um, certainly more, more willing to stand up for their rights. And with the, the first hint of Glasnost and Perestroika, the Armenians in Karabakh began to organize. They began to renew, essentially, the struggle for seceding from Azerbaijan, a struggle for self-determination, if you will, that really had never ceased. That is, uh, when Azerbaijan was, was placed, or excuse me, when Karabakh was placed within Azerbaijan, Going all the way back to, to 1921, uh, the Karabakh Armenians were fighting, were resisting. They didn't have very, few, very many opportunities, obviously, during most of the Soviet era, but the, the struggle never ceased. So as Perestroika Glasnost began to, to emerge, the Karabakh Armenians were right there. They decided, this is our opportunity. Uh, we're going to start organizing. They began gathering uh, signatures for petitions. They began sending delegations to Moscow. So by 1980, by 1988, uh, they already made quite a bit of head, uh, quite a bit of headway. Uh, not in the sense that they achieved any tangible, but they had uh, organized themselves into an effective force. Um, they'd made their contacts in Moscow uh, and. They more or less laid out a strategy, a strategy that hopefully, in, in their eyes, was going to result in reattaching Karabakh to Armenia. The demonstrations in Mount Karabakh actually began a week before the demonstrations began in Yerevan. They began February 13th of 1988, and they were designed very specifically for a purpose, as that, that they were designed to, uh, to support uh, a call in the, the, um, the Oblast Soviet, the Oblast Council, to, uh, press through a to push through a resolution calling for the unification of Karabakh with 
Armenia. Again, organized, very purposeful, uh, very long-term strategic thinking. This, this movement, um, throughout most of 19, the fall of 1987, early 1988, didn't have a, a big impact in Armenia. That is, a few intellectuals knew what was going on in Karabakh. Um, there was some interest among the general population, very little information. In fact, uh, I think a lot of Karabakh Armenians will tell you that um, the average Armenian within Armenia itself really didn't know much about the history of Karabakh. It, it, it wasn't something that, that was extensively studied. So this, this movement, like I said, kind of, kind of filtered into Armenia, but in no way was it uh, an organized movement, in no way did it have a, a, a major impact on the, on the people. Um, as far <clears throat> as, far as um, what happened in Armenia during uh, that, uh, that uh, fateful week in, in February when the Karabakh movement started, um, like I said, the, the interest about Karabakh was, was mo mostly confined to intellectuals. Um, there was an attempt to organize a demonstration in Armenia on February 20th within the, the Opera Square, known as the Theater Square. There were probably, uh, it was Saturday, there were probably 5,000 people in that square, probably uh, Matthew Dermanigoyen was, I think, the first one that Saturday morning in that square. Um, and people kind of milled around. Uh, everyone was very tentative because the, the, the square was, was ringed by, by uh, police. There were a lot of plain, plainclothes police in the, in the crowd as well. People didn't quite know what to expect, whether the, the crowd was going to be dispersed or not. Uh, a few got up and made speeches. The afternoon passed. The atmosphere became a little bit more festive. Nothing happened. They decided to come back the next day. Why not? Why not? Next day was Sunday. Uh, a few of these intellectuals apparently called their friends because the next day, uh, instead of 5,000, there was maybe seven or 8,000 people. Again, the same type of atmosphere. Uh, some of the speakers were a bit bolder. Um, calling outright for for Karabakh unification with Armenia. Um, there was even some criticism of the Armenian government. Again, something that uh, could get you thrown in jail or or even worse, perhaps. So things the the, the, the attitude was that we're gonna we're gonna push this as far as the government allows us. The next thing that happened. The next thing that happened uh, was really the start of the Karabakh movement. People left the square that, that night, February 21st. They went home. Uh, they had heard that the, um, the Central Committee of the Communist Party in Moscow was uh, going to make a statement on Karabakh. Nobody quite knew what to expect, but, but at least the hope was that it would be positive. It wasn't. In fact, the, the statement that was broadcast that night was, was really a slap in the face. The, the uh, participants in the Karabakh movement, in Karabakh primarily we're talking about, were denounced as extremists. Um, they were accused of, of uh, undermining the Soviet system, um, called treasonous. Um, it, it wasn't the reception that, that Armenians were, were expecting. And people were very upset. The next day, the next day, 150,000 people showed up in Theater Square. And all of a sudden, you had a mass movement. Before that, you had intellectuals and students. On Monday, February 22nd, you had Yerevan. That is, you, had, you saw the intellectuals and the students, but now you had the workers. Um, now you had the... The average school teachers. Now you had people that um, normally 
wouldn't be actively involved in our meetings. But they came out because they were angry. They were offended. They were insulted. And that day, um, in a sense, Armenia was transformed. That is, on the streets of Yerevan, um, Armenians have this reputation for, for being aggressive, uh, maybe even a little bit rude, you know, in a, in, a, in a line for chicken or cheese or whatever. There's a lot of elbowing and pushing and things like that. And the bus, you know, the insults are flying back and forth. But in this crowd, in this crowd that assembled in Theater Square, you had a completely different attitude. That, that rudeness essentially evaporated. Uh, instead of the pushing and shoving, people were saying, you know, I'll make way for you. Somebody, for example, would, would uh, fall ill, and all of a sudden a, a, a passageway would open up through the crowd to, so the emergency workers could, could reach that person. That, uh, that night of February 22nd, um, the people that uh, remained in the square, and there were thousands of them, decided that they were going to, to march throughout the city. And so they began uh, a march. Oh, I, I can't remember. I, I wrote, I wrote the, the length of the march somewhere in my book. But uh, 10, 15 miles throughout the city. And the core of this march was to alert all of Yerevan as to what was happening. And they continued to march through, uh, through four, uh, until 4.30 in the morning. People came out of their homes to join the march. Old and young, uh, the crowds sang if they passed through residential areas, if they went past the hospital, everybody was quiet so people could, could have their rest. And the next day, the next day on Tuesday, the crowd doubled to 300,000. And it would continue to grow until it peaked out at about a million people on February 26th. Those are the pictures you probably remember uh, seeing. This, this crowd was, was so massive, of course, that... Uh, you couldn't see from, from one end to another. Um, it covered uh, probably seven or eight square, square blocks of the city, as well as, uh, as well as Theater Square. And, of course, to be part of such a huge crowd obviously had a, a great impact on people. That is... Um, People understood that, that they were part of something that was larger than themselves, and and this and this transformation, if you will, this transformation the transformation of, of consciousness, I think it's been called, um, brought out all kinds of, of interesting reactions in people. During that entire week of, of demonstration, there was not a single crime reported in Yerevan. Uh, there were corrupt officials, for example, repenting in the square, passing out money, asking for, for people's forgiveness. Supposedly, the, the thieves of Yerevan gathered and, and made a pact that they would not commit any crimes during the course of, of the demonstration. Uh, old women brought bread and cheese to the crowd, just passed it out. Taxi drivers open their taxis to, to ferry people back and forth. Um, uh, factory directors brought, uh, I remember one factory director brought uh, cartloads and cartloads of, of Coca-Cola, or, or I guess it was Pepsi at that time, and passed it out free to the crowd. Those types of things, those types of things. And, and like I said, that, that first week of the movement was a euphoric experience. It was something that, that yet on or a few cities I can imagine, had ever experienced. Of course, that week concluded with the beginning of the massacres in Sumgait. Sumgait, of course, is a city in Azerbaijan along the, Ka the Caspian coast uh, just north of, of Baku. Uh, the massacre of Armenians there began probably the... Um, the night of February 28th, it's still difficult to determine exactly how many people were killed, but but uh, probably in the, in the neighborhood of 60 or 70. Uh, more important than the number, though, 
is what that massacre did to the, the Karabakh movement. Um, for one thing, as far as the context of the movement was concerned, it certainly turned it into an ethnic feud. And there's still, there's still a, a debate as to whether the Azerbaijani government was directly involved in organizing the massacre, and perhaps um, even the Soviet KGB. Uh, there's quite a bit of evidence that, that um, the massacre itself was planned. Exactly who orchestrated it is still not entirely clear, but um, certainly the, the effect of the massacre is very clear. Uh, the Karabakh movement would never quite be the same again. And in fact, there was a period of dormancy in Armenia. As of February 27th, the leaders of the movement had decided that they were going to, to take a break, so to speak, to give the Soviet government a chance to, to consider uh, their petition. And officially, they called on Armenians to meet again March 26th. So the movement itself decided that they were going to have a respite. Before March 26th arrived, the Soviet government moved into Yerevan. They moved in with tanks, armored personnel carriers, closed off Theater Square, and basically occupied the city. So the movement itself uh, was shut down. That continued until early May. That is, there, there was, in effect, no Karabakh movement in May and April of 1988. But, excuse me, March and April 1988. But in early May, um, again, a few tentative demonstrations were organized, um, starting with 5,000 people, 10,000 people. Again, the movement started to gather momentum. People gradually lost their fear. And by the end of May, you have the same situation. Um, hundreds of thousands of people in Theater Square, um, a renewed sense of euphoria, a renewed sense that, that Armenians were, were making progress. This, in a way, uh, was probably the, the high point of the entire movement, uh, the period of, of May, early June, 1988. It was led by college students. They were out in, in Theater Square. They staged a, a round-the-clock sit-in on the steps of the Opera House. They fashioned little paper hats. Uh, they drew up posters and, and placards. There were people conducting hunger strikes under the two uh, statues in, in Theater Square. Theater Square became truly a theater, a human, a human theater, a political theater, if you will. Um, you had uh, constant debates going on. Whether there was a, a formal demonstration or not, there were thousands, if not tens of thousands of people in that square around the clock, usually clustered in small groups, arguing with themselves, among themselves, about uh, the particulars of uh, Armenian history or perestroika or the prospects for the Karabakh movement, whatever. But there were always people in that square debating politics. And then the, the Karabakh movement achieved its most notable success June 15th of 1988 when the Armenian Supreme Soviet, in fact, accepted the main demands of the movement. That is, the Armenian Supreme Soviet endorsed the resolution of the Karabakh Soviet to unite Magnus Karabakh with Armenia. And this, of course, was due to, to popular pressure. This was not something that the, the politicians within the Armenian Supreme Soviet would have done on their own. This was the result of this mass movement. And, pe and people legitimately felt very proud about that. They felt that they'd accomplished something. They felt that they'd, they'd influenced their government, if you will. There were, of course, through um, the remainder of that year, many more peaks and valleys, by late June, for example, um, there was uh, another, another valley. There was a, a party congress in Moscow. Armenians were hoping that, again, there would be some type of, of favorable response from Moscow. It was not to be. Instead, the movement again was announced by Gorbachev. Uh, he singled out 
members of the Kanabaf Committee for a special denunciation. A few days after that, you might recall, uh, there was the first uh, killing in Yerevan connected to the Kanabaf movement when uh, uh, a Soviet uh, colonel shot a demonstrator near uh, Armenia's airport. Um, there had been a, a sit-in at the airport that was broken up by, by Soviet troops. And that set off uh, another round of, of uh, protests, and, and in this case, uh, very serious labor strikes. By the, um, the fall of 1988, I'm trying to move through this, this year rather quickly so we can uh, continue with our, our lecture here. By the fall of 1988, uh, Armenians had come to the realization that they were not, they were not going to receive satisfaction from Moscow. That is, they, they came to understand that Glasnost and Perestroika side, Gorbachev was not with them. Uh, that they were seen as a nuisance, essentially, from Gorbachev's perspective. And instead, this forced Armenians to take a, a much different track. That is, they became uh, much more deliberate in organizing their movement in, the, uh, in October of 1988, for example, two candidates put forth by the Karabakh movement, Ashwa Manachari and Khachik Sambutin, were elected to the Armenian Supreme Soviet in very well-run campaigns. The Karabakh movement itself began organizing into a more uh, formal organization uh, called the Armenian National Movement, which, of course, is the the name of, of the ruling party in Armenia today. Um, by the, I think by the fall of 1988, you can say that the Karabakh movement, in a way, had become an established political organization. Uh, not in a formal sense, but people were already beginning to think about the future. And then, of course, at the end of the year, and this is uh, 1988 again, we have the earthquake. In Armenia. Even before the earthquake, uh, there's already a, a flow of refugees out of Az Armen Armenians out of Azerbaijan, Azerbaijanis out of Armenia, uh, a lot of violence along the border of Armenia and Azerbaijan. The situation in, in Karabakh is becoming more and more difficult. Azerbaijan is imposing a, a much stricter blockade on the, on the Karabakh Armenians. And then the year closes with the members of the Karabakh Committee being arrested, being arrested. So it ends on a, on a, very, on a very difficult note, but at the same time, it was a year in which Armenians had, in a way, set foot on the world stage. Um, what I want to talk about, um, in addition to that brief chronology of the first year of the Karabakh movement, is a bit about the organization of the Karabakh Committee. The, um, the Karabakh Committee itself was um, something of a misnomer in Armenia. Um, the first Karabakh Committee, the Karabakh Committee that emerged in uh, February of 1988, was not much of a committee, for one thing. Um, the leader of the movement, was Igor Moradian. Uh, Moradian was an economist born in Baku, uh, a, someone who had spent uh, most of his life in Armenia, but uh, still considered him still considered himself more deeply connected with Karabakh. A very um, strong-willed, single-minded individual, big burly guy. Uh, the type of guy that uh, liked to throw his weight around, uh, despite the fact that he was, at the time, only in his late 30s. And he had been instrumental in putting the, the Karabakh agenda forth in Moscow. That is, he had been one of these people that shuttled back and forth between Karabakh, Armenia, Moscow, making the contacts with officials. He's the one that had cultivated ties with the government in Armenia, 
Uh, probably with the KGB, apparently he had done enough so that at least the Armenian government was willing to allow those early demonstrations to take place. But by the same token, he in no way anticipated the public outpouring that would take place in Armenia. That is, today, for example, there are a lot of theories that the Karabakh movement was somehow organized by these nefarious unseen forces. And certainly, uh, Igor Maradian had his contacts with those forces in Armenia. But those forces were perhaps capable of turning out 10,000 people, let's say 20,000 people. But to turn out half a million, a million people on the street, that's beyond the, the capacity of any conspiracy, of even the, the KGB, if you will. And Moradin himself really wasn't prepared to, to lead a, a mass movement of that magnitude. The Karabakh Committee itself, to whatever extent existed in those early days, was not organized until the third day of the demonstrations when a delegation from Moscow came to Armenia. Um, and it came to Armenia because of this huge outpouring of people. And all of a sudden, Muradjian realized that, that he, had to, he had to present some type of committee to these people. They'd come to Armenia to, to meet with the leaders of the, the Karabakh movement. The leadership really didn't exist. So he put together uh, a committee of, of a handful of people almost overnight. Uh, there was always a, uh, a division. On one side, you had people like Muradjan, people I would call uh, very hardline nationalists. They were interested only in the unification of Karabakh with Armenia. That was their, the only item on their agenda. Uh, they, they had no interest in democratization, um, little concern for Glasnost and Perestroika. They weren't connected in any way to the larger reform movement within the Soviet Union. On the other side, you had these democratic idealists. These were the people that, that essentially were part of this, this larger Soviet movement. Uh, they, were look, they were looking for something beyond Karabakh. They were talking about uh, democracy. They were the ones that were speaking out against the government of Garen Demirjan. Um, they brought up issues like environmental pollution, uh, fighting corruption, revamping the education system. So this was, this was uh, an, an entirely different type of, of beast than, than the, the, the faction that Moradian uh, represented. And eventually, these two groups came into conflict. Uh, it broke out openly in May of 1988, when Muradjan tried to use the, the, the Karabakh movement to rally support for Gadan Demirjan, the, uh, the first secretary of the Armenian Communist Party at the time. Demirjan was already on his way out by the spring of 1988. And um, apparently, as the story goes, he was hoping that if Muradjan could demonstrate some popular support for him or stir up a little trouble, who knows? Uh, Moscow would be reluctant to, to dismiss him. They got rid of him anyway. Gorbachev, uh, by the end of the month, had gotten rid of Demirjan. But in the meantime, the demonstrations that Muradjan had tried to organize on Demirjan's behalf backfired. And the Karabakh movement, movement at that point divided. The Karabakh committee came under the control of we'll call them the Democrats. When I say the Democrats, I'm talking about Vasken Manugian, Ashut Maharacharyan, and Levon Depretosian. These were the, the three most prominent individuals within this, this newly reconstructed Karabakh committee. And they were the ones that essentially would dominate the movement for the rest of its existence. They were the ones that um, would be arrested in, um, at the end of 1988, they were the ones that uh, would be identified later with um, uh, the Karabakh agenda as the um, Soviet Union began to unravel. And they were the ones that turned out that ended up 
popping up at the um, at the forefront of the political landscape after the Soviet Union actually fell apart. Um, let me let me speak very briefly about uh, who these people are. As a group, I would say that the new members of the Karabakh Committee represented disenfranchised intellectuals. That is, these were people that had grown up with the right connections. That is, they were well-educated, uh, many of them came from prominent families, but for whatever reason, they decided to withdraw from the Soviet system. That is, they didn't want to get their hands dirty in the Soviet system. They considered themselves above that, if you will. Uh, to that extent, they kind of considered themselves almost an alternative source of, of power within Armenia. That is, they were the outsiders looking in, but by the same token, they felt that they deserved to be on the inside. They deserved to be the people that were, were making the decisions. Um, one group, and this divides along generational lines, one group had got its feet wet politically during the uh, 1965 demonstrations that took place um, on April 24th in Armenia. This was the first demonstration to commemorate the genocide, the 50th anniversary of the genocide uh, in Yerevan. Vaske uh, Manugyan, Levon Depertosyan, Rafael Ozayan, they'd all taken part in those demonstrations. And in fact, um, Levon Depertosyan apparently was, was detained at least for a few days because of his participation. The other group was a younger group uh, centered around Asha Manacharyan and the former mayor of Yerevan, Hamparsum Galstian. And they get to know each other as members of Komsomol at Yerevan State University in uh, the mid-1970s. They attempted to uh, institute some, some democratic reforms within Komsomol. They're eventually dismissed from the organization and received some some black marks on their records, but that was the idea. They were, they were promoting democracy in those early days. Um, that group ended up clustering around this experimental school that, that uh, I was introduced to in the fall of, of 1987. As far as an organized political movement, um, I think for, for most of 1988, the Karabakh Committee was really the baiting club, if anything. Um, I can't say that um, in any way they were a well-organized conspiracy. I, I saw how meetings were called, for example. For the most part, somebody would decide, let's have a, a demonstration today. The word would go out. People would start making phone calls. Uh, Hago would call Gago. Gago would call Murad, Murad would call Deacon, and that's that's how the word spread. And all of a sudden, there were you know 200,000 people in, in Theater Square. But in se in the sense of creating a any type of, of structure, uh, that really didn't exist in 1988. In terms of strategy, the chief uh, strategician really was Vaskin Manugyan. He was the one that uh, created the Armenian National Movement. He drafted its its bylaws, um, many of, of, of um, those initial statements wound up, in fact, in the Armenian Constitution that was uh, passed in, in, by referendum in 1995. Um, as far as Vasken Manugyan's uh, intentions, the story is that, that he'd written this, these bylaws years ago. That is long before 1988, and was really just looking for his for an opportunity to to lead a political movement. So here's somebody that always hoped uh, that this opportunity would come along, and and when it did, he was uh, he was certainly at the at the forefront. I have to say one thing though, um, and this is um, in response to uh, uh, a very common assumption prevalent in Armenia today. 
a lot of a lot of Armenians will tell you today, well, those Karabakh committee members, they understood the Soviet Union was falling apart. Uh, they were just a bunch of opportunists. This was this was a chance to to seize power. As far as I'm concerned, I think uh, again, if you look at things objectively, I think most people would agree. In 1988, very few people, very few people, could predict the Soviet Union was going to fall apart. Uh, certainly, people within the Karabakh movement had no conception of what lay ahead. Most of them, if anything, were expecting a crackdown within a few months, if not a couple of years. This, this was their chance either to be on the political stage for a brief moment in history, or in other cases, people felt this was their, their duty to, uh, to come forth and contribute their leadership. But in terms of jumping on a political bandwagon, I don't think that that argument um, holds much weight. It really wasn't until the members of the Karabakh Committee were arrested in December of 1988 and released from prison in December of 1999 that they were elevated to hero status. Until that, they had been certainly respected, but when they left prison in uh, May of 1989, they really came out as martyrs. That, in a sense, launched their, their political careers, although I think uh, that's still much too early to say that uh, the Soviet Union was headed for a collapse. I think uh, there were still grounds for, for fear. But if nothing else, they'd established their reputations uh, in prison. Finally, let me, uh, let me conclude by, by returning to uh, the situation in, in Yerevan today. I want to talk very briefly about uh, what I see as the most important legacy of the Karabakh movement. Today, of course, Armenians are, are very disillusioned, uh, especially with their, their political leaders. There's almost a sense of, of despair as far as politics is concerned. Um, most people, I'm afraid, yet about today, buy into one sort of conspiracy theory or another regarding the Karabakh movement, or at the very least, they feel they were completely duped by um, the leaders of the movement. And of course, um, political revolutions never live up to, uh, to their promises. Uh, I think... Um, the uh, gravestone of uh, Hampartsum Galstian is very apt. Hampartsum Galstian, member of the Karabakh Committee, he was appointed uh, mayor of Yerevan by Levon der Petrosian, uh, I think late, either late 1990, early 1991. Uh, certainly a dedicated individual, but he was not prepared uh, for an office like that, and, and he didn't do a very good job. Anyway, tragically, he was murdered at the end of 1994, no one knows exactly who did it, but uh, many, many people blame uh, officials in the, in the Dare Petrosian government, specifically the, the former interior minister and current mayor of Yerevan, Vanessa Adelian. On, on Humbert uh, Galstian's gravestone is a saying by uh, Otto von Bismarck, I think which is very appropriate. Um, revolution, uh, romantics make revolutions, or excuse me, romantics create revolutions, uh, fanatics carry them out, and villains benefit from them. And I think that's essentially the consensus in, in Yerevan today. But let me talk, I think, about how the movement changed Armenia for the better and in a way prepared Armenia uh, for the present. First of all, I think the movement helped consolidate the Armenian self-image. I think it helped erase some of the old divisions that had prevailed in Armenia for most of the century. I'm talking about divisions between 
uh, old-time urban residents in Yerevan and the peasants that came in by the, by the thousands, the hundreds of thousands in the 1950s and 60s, the divisions between the, the Deratis and the, the Harantats that came after World War II, uh, divisions among different regions within Armenia. I think a lot of those divisions were blurred, in a sense, by the Karabakh movement. Armenia came together. At least they came together in Theater Square, and people talked about the fact that, that Yerevan, Armenia itself, had finally grown up, had finally matured, into a real city, a melting pot, a real nation. Now, I think, uh, in a way, uh, that newfound cohesion has stayed with Armenians. I also think that the sense of purpose that was forged in Theater Square in those days, in 1988 especially, has fortified Armenia for the hardships that have come in recent years. I, I think, for example, that... Um, Without the Karabakh movement, Armenia would not have been able to withstand the uh, pressure of the war with Azerbaijan. I don't think, uh, I don't think, for example, Armenians would be uh, occupying Karabakh today if it had not been for the Karabakh movement. I think, uh, in that sense, the sense of purpose that, that came out of Theater Square was was very important. I also think. Uh, <clears throat> that um, that sense of purpose um, helped Armenians prepare for the, the winters without electricity, without heat, in some cases without food. I think today when you go to Armenia, Armenians are, are most proud, not of their role within the Karabakh movement, very few people will even admit to that, but instead the fact that they withstood these terrible winters of recent years. I think um, that, more than anything else, has um, become a rite of passage, if you, if you will, for the Armenian nation. And I think, finally, um, the Karabakh movement helped make Armenia politically a more mature society. Armenia, almost more, almost uh, first among the former Soviet republics, saw that they could not rely on Moscow, they could not count on Moscow to, to solve their political problems. Um, in a way, Armenia became, Armenians became actors on the political stage. Um, they realized that, that they could have an impact on the government, that they could take history, if you will, into their own hands and, and push things forward. And I'll, I'll close by saying that I think the, the spirit that came out of Theater Square accounted for the fact that last September, uh, with the presidential elections, I don't want to go into the details. Uh, I don't want it to. I don't want to take sides uh, too much. But with the shenanigans, we'll say that that went on uh, during the course of the ballot counting and the aftermath. I think it was really the political maturity of the people that prevented a civil war in Armenia. And to a large extent, I think we have the, um, the Karabakh movement to thank for that. Um, I'm certainly open to questions now. I'd like to throw out a question myself, uh, since we are a relatively small group, and it looks, uh, looks like also a very well-informed group. Um, I'd, I'd invite your comments on, on what you think the impact of the Karabakh movement has been on Armenia today. Thank you. I want to give uh, Mark a few moments of rest, and then we'll have the questions and answers. Uh, I have a piece of information that I don't know whether you're all aware of or not. I, I was just informed of it tonight that the new Prime Minister of Armenia is Robert Kachaya of Now that's, uh, that's really a, an amazing development. Now he's President of Karabakh, he's become Prime Minister of Armenia. How are they going to work this thing out, I don't know. And what this will mean, uh, I'm sure a lot of people are going to speculate on it. I think there's going to be a lot of newspapers about it. Uh, 
Lucy Bedarian heard the news on BBC tonight, so I guess it's true. Uh, I would like to just inform you that anyone who purchases uh, Mark's book will get an automatic deduction of your admission fee. So uh, you buy the book, you subtract the admission fee, and that's an extra discount you'll get. For members, uh, you'll get an extra discount of three dollars. For non-members, five dollars. Uh, most of you maybe have received our announcements of our future program, but I'd like to just call them to your attention again. Uh, on April 3rd, we will have an illustrated travel talk by Joseph Weidig, and Joe is here somewhere. Uh, where are you, Joe? Here he is. Uh, he will be showing us slides of his trip to eastern Turkey, to Armenian villages, towns, and historic sites. And I'm sure that you'll find this very interesting. Uh, with the latest views of these areas. He, he covered over 30 different towns, villages, and historic sites. Uh, and two weeks after that, we'll have a, another illustrated talk by Dr. Armand Benedictin in New Jersey. We'll talk about education in Armenia and how that is the uh, key to Armenia's future. I particularly want to call your, call your attention to a special lecture uh, that's been organized for May 15th. And this one will be held at the St. James Cultural Center. We anticipate a large turnout, and that's why it's being held over there with uh, the cooperation of St. James Cultural Committee. And this is about Christians and Jews under Islam, the Armenian experience. The author, or the speaker that, that will be there, is from Switzerland. And she'll be in the United States just for a month uh, in connection with a book that has just come out uh, uh, more or less on this subject. There's a lot in the book about the Armenians, and uh, they were anxious. She was anxious, and her husband, uh, to be able to speak to an Armenian audience about this subject. So I particularly urge you to come to that particular uh, lecture on May 8th, uh, the week before. We have Peter Balakian coming. He'll be talking about his book that had just come out, uh, which is his memoir as an American Armenian. And then on May 22nd, the week after that lecture, Professor Russell will be here, and we'll be talking about Yerushay Chodets. And then on June the 5th, uh, Donald Fullerfeld will be talking about, uh, I would like to put a little different title to the talk, The Underside of Armenia. Uh, he will reveal things that uh, normally are not heard about or known about, about life in Armenia. And there may be another program after that, uh, a couple of weeks after that, we'll announce that when it gets propped up. Uh, I think now it's time to entertain questions. Does anyone want to answer the question that uh, Mark asked? According to Meter the Spectator, I think it was about 1995, the President Edward Rossiak was disassociating Armenia from Karabakh. And I now, what a contrast. What was the purpose of his disassociating Armenia from Karabakh? Well, I think um, this is, this, this really strikes at the core of the, the, like the, the people's disillusionment um, with the government. Um, the chief rap against Der Petrosian is that he rode Karabakh to power and then abandoned it once he, he came to power. I'm, I'm not so sure how, how valid that analysis is in the sense that, that Der Petrosian, as I mentioned, always was part of the wing of the Karabakh movement that really looked at the, the broader questions of reform within the Soviet Union. So uh, he was never, like Igor Moradian, um, single-mindedly focused on um, the reunification of, of Karabakh with Armenia. So I, I think his actions really, um, in a way, were fairly consistent with, with his rhetoric. That is, it, it really wasn't unexpected uh, the, the policy he's pursued. I mean, he still obviously gives plenty of lip service 
to Karabakh. And I don't think uh, politically he can ever abandon Karabakh. But uh, it's it's interesting this this political dance that's taking place now. Would you say that the appointment of Robert Kucharyan is an attempt on his part to let the population know that he's still behind Karabakh? Well, I think you know I think um, what I think nothing else. The uh, September 1996 elections uh, woke Derek Petrosian up to the fact that he's not very popular. And um, the appointment of Armin Sarkisian, I think, was an attempt to, to rehabilitate his reputation and the reputation of the Armenian government. I think the appointment of Robert Kocharyan fits in with that. I think right now he's looking for almost anything that will they'll save, um, save his regime politically. Uh, well, there's two sides to the Kochagian uh, appointment. One is to get a uh, popular figure in his administration, uh, but the other is to take over Karabakh completely. Do you have any deal about that? Or? I mean, my, my, my personal opinion, well, now we're straight up our, our, our theme here, but, but but my, my personal feeling is that um, Armenia's diplomatic maneuvering room is so narrow that uh, I, I, I can't interpret this as a bid to have any impact on the larger question of, of the resolution of the, of the Karabakh problem. I think this, this has to do with internal Armenian politics rather than international diplomacy. It, back back in 1988, well, I think I think you have to look at it um, from the perspective of Gorbachev and the other leaders in the Kremlin. The Karabakh issue was seen as a nuisance. Gorbachev's main priority was to get the Soviet economy back on its feet again. Uh, the last thing he needed were nationalities questions. In, as far as Russia's policy toward Armenia, well, I mean, that goes back and forth. That's, that's, that's more complicated. And I think that has to do with more than anything else, oil. Azerbaijan's oil, unfortunately. Lack of popularity with your Russia. Well, Good question. I think I think all three. I think all three. I think I think in many sense, in many senses, um, regardless of what he what he had done, he would have been blamed for uh, Armenia's economic problems, which are not of his making. I mean, he walked into a situation where Armenia was blockaded, recovering from an earthquake. Its trade ties had completely collapsed. No country in the former Soviet Union was in a more difficult position than Armenia in 1992. Uh, and in that sense, there's not much he could have done. Unfortunately, I think he's contributed to the problem rather than solving it. And I think the, the corruption, uh, more than anything else, has probably uh, hurt his popularity within the population. But I think, I think, I think the answer to your question was basically in, in your question itself. You know, I'm just trying to visualize what somebody else would have done in this place. And, and what is the to that? Well, I don't think... What I hear is it's not so much a question of policy, but in terms of his own presentation. That is, um, he's become very reclusive. Um, before the election, for example, Apparently, he left his office just a, a handful of times in 1996. Um, he's never been somebody that, that is willing to go on TV and, and attempt to, to rally the people. Uh, he's not a good politician in that sense. And I think, um, I think more and more people hold that against him, that um, he doesn't give the people hope. 
He's, he's effectively saying there's not much I can do. And in, in, a, in a lot of ways, he's correct. A lot of ways, he's correct. Yeah, you draw a, a sharp I think um, the the nationalistic wing represented uh, a minority within the Armenian population. I think the the reason people came out into Theater Square in February 1988 is because in general they were dissatisfied with the situation in Armenia. They were dissatisfied with their lives. Uh, Karabakh, of course, was was a pretext in in um, something that they became very much attached to. But I think they were looking for something something larger. And I think initially, in February of 1988, they didn't know what they were looking for. They didn't know what they were looking for, but they knew they had a lot to complain about. Was it, was it a nationalistic motivation, or was it a motivation to improve their lives in the Armenian people? Was it a nationalistic motivation, or was it a motivation to improve their lives within the Soviet that At that time, uh, there were certain, in 1988, uh, only a small handful of people were advocating independence. That would be the, the Hadith Khan group. No way. No way. Not in, even even up until the end. I mean if you if you look at what leaders um, of the Karabakh movement in nineteen ninety one were saying as the Soviet Union was was unraveling, especially the private comments, they realized that Armenia was in serious trouble. At that point I think um, I think if somehow they could have patched the Soviet Union together again for a few more years, uh, they would have favored that. Even though at the time, Gorbachev was supporting um, Azerbaijan's efforts to depopulate Karabakh of Armenians. We hear a lot of, I just want to just to pursue one second. We hear an awful lot about uh, this nationalist. I mean, I think um, I think there are different levels of, of, of nationalism uh, in this discussion. If we're talking about the Baltic republics, there's no question. Uh, nationalism in the Baltic republics and the Soviet era meant independence, the struggle for independence. And Armenia meant something different. Armenians were certainly nationalistic in the sense that they were high asset and high then asset. Yeah, yeah. But I think they saw their future within the Soviet Union, certainly under Russian protection. Did somebody have a question here? A comment? I have a question. I have some comments. Mm -hmm. Please. I invited them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your talk was wonderful, but I have some comments, and I really have to make them. You began by saying Armenia was a backwater. Relative backwater? No, I'm... I'm backwater with an opera academy of science and university institutes an atomic reactor go on and on. I'm talking about the self-perception of Armenia. Armenians perceived Armenia to be a backwater. No, uh, not that Yvonne is an autonomous republic. Karabakh was an autonomous oblast. Sure, yes. That was the greatest thing they could have done. 
No, I agree. I agree. No, no. Um, after World War II, when when Stalin um, and under Khrushchev as well encouraged peasants to move to the city, especially uh, throughout throughout the throughout the, the Soviet Union. Yeah, since. No, I didn't say that. Well, I think um, the problem now in Armenia is that the general population um, is so disillusioned in general about politics that um, many people would reject almost um, any political movement that were to rise. I think that's the reason the, the, the prime minister that just resigned, Armin Sarkisian, was popular because he represented um, common sense, um, dispassionate administrative competence. I think that's what people are looking for. I think Armenia is in, in dire need of um, a healing political movement, but unfortunately, I'm not sure if this is the time. Can you go, uh, maybe comment on? Well, again, I'm I'm straying a long way from my my narrow expertise. Um, I think um, you know in terms of in terms of charismatic figures, you're probably familiar with the prominent faces in Armenian politics, the Vaskan Manugians, the Vaskan Adelians, who's very popular, by the way, in Armenia right now, the Bagir Hadikans. Uh, Rakhil and Esther Star has faded a bit, but uh, he's still he's still relatively popular. I think pe people are looking for a fresh face. They're looking for somebody that's not connected um, to past politics. And I think that's one of the reasons that that uh, Robert Kocharian will probably uh, be received well. I think that's one of the reasons Armin Sarkisian was popular. I mean, people are even looking um, to figures from the communist era with much more respect now. The last um, um, first secretary of the Armenian Communist Party, Vladimir uh, Mosisian, he's the Minister of Agriculture now. He's somebody that, that commands a great deal of respect. But there's there's no, if, if, if we're looking for a rising star in the current political scene, I don't think that person's emerged yet. Yeah. Uh, what became of uh, um, as far as Armenia is concerned, he's completely uh, he's completely out of politics. He still has uh, contacts with uh, a lot of, uh, especially Slavophile groups in Russia. That is, uh, groups in, in Russia that, that emphasize especially Orthodox Christianity and things like that. Uh, I guess he still carries some weight in that sense, but. Um, Right now, he's he's basically uh, unemployed in Armenia and um, um, living off um, the charity of, of his friends, and really has very limited uh, political involvement. When we were, I, as I was mentioning earlier, we were there uh, uh, for during the winter months, and uh, there was a rumor circulating that that Asha Manacharyan and Bono Theradelian were pat patching up their differences. Although I don't know what that means at this point. Any other questions or comments? Well, thank you for, for sticking out on such a, a difficult night.
Thank you, Mark. Uh, if anyone hasn't uh, deposited their ticket, this one now we don't have a drawing. <laughs>